Lake Max Steam is a week-long program of its inspiring learning experiences that are centred around science, technology, engineering, art and maths that is held each year in conjunction with National Science Week. It's a pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce Professor Veena Sahawala, a leading expert in the field of recycling science, a founding director of the Centre for Sustainable Materials Research and Technology at the University of New South Wales and New South Wales Australian of the Year for 2022. Professor is producing a new generation of green materials, products and resources made entirely or primarily from waste. Veena also heads the ARC Industrial Transformation Research Hub for Green Manufacturing, a leading national research centre that works in collaboration with industry to ensure new science is translated into real world environmental and economic benefits. Veena has been extensively recognised for the innovation and significance of her work, including via election to be a fellow of the esteemed Australian Academy of Science. Would you please welcome Professor Veena Sahawala here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor, for those kind words uh, of introduction. Um, and thank you for having me here in this um, beautiful part of the world. I was just telling Madam Mayor how lucky you all are to have this beautiful place that you call home. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's indeed a privilege and a pleasure for me to be here and uh, telling you a little bit about our journey uh, at the Smart Centre at the University of New South Wales. Uh, of course, you know, when we start to talk about the fact that different types of waste materials um, can actually be utilised as part of the whole array of products we make, it's always worth recognizing that you know we've, we've come a long way and there are many, many organizations from councils to businesses across Australia that are actually really passionate about this work. And I think to me, that's really what's gonna take us uh, a long way. That first and foremost, it's about the passion and the commitment that people have, uh, people like yourselves and, and other council groups uh, that actually recognize that if we come together as a community, uh, we can actually start to do so much at the local level. And part of the reason why I wanted to take a moment to talk about what it means to do things locally in your particular area is telling you the story about our micro factories. Because for a lot of people, when they hear micro factories, one of the first things is, well, how micro is it? <laughs> and, and I guess the, the best way to think about this is that, you know, this space that we're sitting in, this could host a micro factory, right? So you start to sort of think, what does actually a micro factory mean? What do we actually mean when we talk about sustainability? Again, we hear a lot of these words, and what do we actually do when we want to be able to reduce our carbon footprint? How does science, technology, engineering actually play a role in, in the work that we want to do? And, and this is where, of course, it's, it is a complex system. If it was easy, it would have been done by now, right? We're used to thinking about this, the typical sort of linear way in which we might buy some products, we might use it, and when it breaks or becomes obsolete, we throw it away, right? But if you can imagine that everything that we've made, everything that exists on this planet, what if we could take all those materials and what if we could actually change them, transform them into new products? And what if we could do that over and over again, right? Then we would never really be putting away anything into landfill. And I guess to me, that's really at the heart of what we talk about, whether it is what we do in a micro factory setting, or indeed the other end of the spectrum, some of the large operations that we have in manufacturing. And of course, I have to acknowledge a manufacturing partner with whom we've been working for a long, long time, who's not too far away from here. So you're probably wondering, ah, who? <laughs> the slight hint is that they make steel and they are global leaders in the production of their steel products. And to me, it's, it's a proud moment when you know, we can actually talk about the fact that not only are we doing world leading science, but we also are working with corporates right here in Australia who are actually committed to supporting science and technology, but are also committed to being 
you know, continuing to push those boundaries of how science can actually make a difference when it comes to talking about manufacturing, but also sustainability. You know, it's, it's nice to be able to say, look, I'm a world leader when it comes to manufacturing, here's my product. But it is also equally challenging to be able to say, and how do I do all of this in the context of sustainability? That means how do I continue to make high quality products that perform well and for which there is a global market, but how do I supply the kinds of products that I know I have to keep producing as a manufacturer of high quality and do it in a sustainable way? So in this particular instance, the example of producing green steel how do I actually do that? You know, how do I make my products while I can make green steel? So one of the things we've actually done with Mollycorp, so there you go, that's the name of the industry partner, not too far away from here. One of the things we've been doing with Mollycorp is really basically not only showing that green steel can be produced and shown in the labs that it can work, and all of that, which is good, because you've got to have that foundational science, and this is where the Australian Research Council, the ARC, supports basic science. But also in partnership with Mollycorp, we're actually starting to now embark on this journey where we can do it on a large industrial scale operation. So this is the whole point, that whether we're talking about micro factories or whether we're talking about large steel making operations, we can actually show that sustainability can be achieved in a way that we can reduce our carbon footprint, we can achieve goals of circular economy. And so in the case of steel making, we're actually showing that waste tires can be injected. That polymer injection technology is a world leading technology that in partnership with Mollycorp, we will be taking it out to the world. Imagine that story where the world will be able to, in, in years to come, you know, operators who've got similar types of operations as Mollycorp will be able to say, well, actually, that's an Australian technology, right? And it was an Australian company that put us on that journey and was built on Australian science. And I think to me, a lot of credit has to be given to those industries that actually came along on this journey more than a decade ago with us. And I think that's the important point when no one was really talking about it. We were actually already engaging in not only having those conversations, but we were engaging in what does it take to do the science? What does it take to actually do the technology? And would an Australian company want to lead the world in this space? And as you can imagine, the short answer is yes. That's exactly why we have to acknowledge and credit those organizations in Australia that want to embark on these kinds of journeys. We want to be the first in the world to do it. You know, oh, it's not all that sort of much of a competition in the world when you look at where we stand with our partnership. I've got colleagues in many parts of the world who go, we're really envious of the fact that you guys have some incredibly amazing industries and incredibly fantastic universities and young people who are interested in STEAM. And I guess that's what we're celebrating this week, right? This is what it's about. It's about people, ultimately. If young people are committed, we've got people in businesses, councils, local governments, and the list goes on and on, state governments, federal governments supporting. Because why are we doing this? Again, it is for Australia to be, continue to be the place that we have this beautiful environment that we can enjoy, right? So this is the first thing that strikes us when we look at our clear blue skies and we look at this beautiful space that we live in. And I think we've got to, we've got to never take that for granted. But we've also got to show perhaps leadership that we can actually show to the rest of the world how this can be done. So if there are countries in the world that are, for example, looking at producing steel in this case, why would we not actually start to look at how we translate that technology to the rest of the world? And I think to me that's the best part. When we talk about decarbonization and reducing our carbon footprint by reducing our dependency on the, the materials that we know we have to transition into more and more of renewable materials, well, the fact that we can start to look at renewable materials, whether they are waste tires or electronic waste or indeed plastic waste, if we can start to see all of these materials coming back to life over and over again in different forms, well, then they're renewables, right? Because they can be renewed over and over again. 
It's not as if you're always converting them back into the same product. So it's not always saying, well, I've got a plastic bottle, so I'll convert it into another plastic bottle. It's actually about saying that, okay, tires, an example of a product, did its job, it served its purpose as a tire. Now, of course, when it's no longer roadworthy, it doesn't mean that those molecules inside a tire are not useful anymore. That's not the case at all. That molecular structure, if you zoom in right down at that level, what we find is it's actually got hydrogen as part of its structure. It's got carbon as part of its structure. So why don't we see that as an alternative to some of the coal-based materials that are typically used? And that's exactly what we have done. We've actually shown that it is possible to not only do that science in the lab, to be able to show that we can release hydrogen molecules from these tires, and show that it is possible to make metals by using tires in a way that you're not burning it, but you're liberating those tiny, tiny clean molecules. They are clean molecules of hydrogen. That hydrogen reacts with iron oxide and produces iron. So that's the conversion. That's what we're doing. We're making metals by using these reducing agents. So hydrogen is known to be a powerful reducing agent. What we have proven is that we can actually use waste tires as a source of hydrogen in a clean and a green way to be able to liberate those molecules. And not only that, we've actually shown that the process is more efficient. So if I'm a hard-nosed steelmaker who goes, ah, oh, yes, all good green technologies, but how efficient is it? Guess what the science has proven? That it's actually more efficient than some of the traditional materials that are used in steel making. Now again, who would have thought, right? Because we'd assume, well, it's a waste material. Really, it's all bad. But that's not the case at all. It's not really a waste if you can actually use it in many different ways when it shows that it is a lot more efficient than traditional materials. Well, really, so we have to start to redefine what waste is. Waste is really not a waste. It's actually a material that's waiting to come back to life in a different form. So we're simply looking at circular economy here, except what we are showing in this region, that we're actually doing it. We're walking the talk. And I think to me, that's the important part of collaboration, of government research, fundamental research, showing that we've got businesses right here in our region who want to be world leaders when it comes to technological advancements. And that's really what we mean by sustainability, right? Because we're thinking about how we can contribute to large operations and those small businesses. So we've got also smaller businesses we operate and work with. And those are the kinds of things we do when it comes to micro factories. So you can see we've got the full spectrum we can set up a micro factory in your region if you wanted. That could take your waste glass and your waste textiles and produce all kinds of beautiful products. So let me start to tell you a little bit of what our journey with Smart Center has been all about over the past decade. As I said, not only have we been looking at doing the research from a fundamental scientific point of view, but we've also been translating all of this into practice. But the focus very much has to be about the fact that we need to show how these products that we make are going to be of high quality. It's no point making something if it doesn't meet the engineering specifications for a particular application. And that's really what we have to start to look at. The whole of system approach, taking these input waste resources, manufacturing, making innovative products, and ultimately showing that it is fit for purpose. So what do you do when you have a pile of e-waste? You can't just assume that it's no longer useful just because it stopped working as part of an electronic device. Lots of electronic devices have circuit boards in it, of course. That's, that's one of the key components. So what would you do with these when your products become obsolete? Well, actually, here's what you do. All of that metal, copper and tin, for example, from your waste printed circuit boards, can actually be reformed and produced out of these circuit boards. But, you know, does that mean you have to set up a great big smelter to do it? Not necessarily. What we've shown that we can actually, our e-waste microfactories can produce these high quality alloys. 
for different types of applications, whether they are copper-based alloys or tin-based alloys. But the difference here is, as you can see, we're producing these alloys in a very selective way. And what I mean by that is that you can have one circuit board that might have these two different types of metals, copper and tin, and in a very selective way, we synthesize these different kinds of metals. And why does that matter? It matters because, of course, our complex products, particularly in the world of electronics, is a collection of different kinds of metals and compounds and ceramics. We can't just assume that we're going to, in every instance, throw it all in into one big grand smelter and it's all going to do the job and it's going to produce all of these things. What we are saying, though, if you could indeed find multiple pathways to thermally isolate these metals in a clean and a green way, that would allow us to constantly bring these materials back to life over and over again. And in the same way, while we're talking electronics, how can you look past batteries, right? You've got all of these important batteries that we use in our lives from the disposable ones to the rechargeable ones. And of course, they're not just these little small ones, but they're also some of the larger ones that do such an important job when we talk about renewables again. You know, you need all of those lithium ion batteries. When you talk about your electric vehicles, you know, storage devices is going to be critical for the future. But again, if you actually look inside a battery, well, what does it actually contain? Again, you know, you might look at it and go, oh gosh, there's a bit of zinc in it, a bit of manganese, and then there are all these important elements that are present. You know, should we just assume that there is one big grand magical machine that you know, I mean, we wish, like a Willy Wonka chocolate factory, everything just goes in and everything comes out at the other end exactly the same. Well, it doesn't quite work like that when it comes to materials, right? In the sense that they're still valuable elements. They've still done a great job in this form. And now what we're saying is that to be able to bring it back to life in different, different forms, different structures, different chemistries, we can do that by actually being very controlling the way we synthesize and we manage and control these different pathways. Because imagine on all of these devices, you need lots of elements, lots of different types of products. So the fact that you can make them in a controlled way, imagine if we could all start to think about our regions as places where we're producing these sustainable materials in a way that they become part of the supply chain. So we suddenly go from looking at this as a waste product to looking at this as a fantastic resource. And it's a great resource in this case, that powdered material inside is rich in manganese and zinc. Well, why won't we do it? Why won't we then take some of that zinc, convert it into a form, and this is what we've done, convert it into a form of zinc oxide. That can be quite a useful material for another application. So if we could start to imagine this whole sort of ability to keep changing forms and structures of different kinds of materials, well, actually, then nothing would really be a waste, would it? I mean, it would actually keep coming back to life. And when someone says, oh, but that device is now obsolete, you know, we no longer need this. Well, we may not need that device, but all of those materials that are there inside are still useful. And this is where the concept of the fourth R comes in for us. The three R's of reduce, reuse, recycle, of course, are important. We should always be looking first and foremost towards how we reduce our consumption of products that we use. But there are important products, like we've talked about batteries and tires. You know, we need them. But that doesn't mean that at the end of that one life, that they are no longer useful they actually are still useful and will always continue to be like we've talked about, whether it's the molecules of hydrogen that we go after in case of tires, or whether it's some of these important elements that come out of batteries. They're all important because they can be, through that fourth hour concept of reform, they can always be reformed into innovative solutions. And if we can make materials, well, what's stopping us from making new components out of them, right? So what we have shown, particularly in energy storage devices, that we can actually produce these types of materials right down at the micro level by controlling how they behave, how they actually get produced, we can actually then start to make different components. So what's stopping us from making electrodes 
inside a battery. And then you might say, well, okay, hang on. So if we can make some parts and components, surely there's a big market for that. The world needs energy storage devices. If we're sitting in the driver's seat, we're making sustainable materials, we're making products. Well, actually, we could also be sitting in the driver's seat in manufacturing those important overall products itself. So, you know, it's not a huge leap of imagination once you start to make these materials and then products and then say, why can't we be the place where people look to and go, well, actually, let's get some of those products from Australia because they use sustainable materials to make them. And I think this is where we can identify and establish that the world is hungry when it comes to sustainability. And we're at that journey, that revolution of sustainable materials. And that revolution of sustainable materials, we will be able to show that every bit of material should not actually be ever called a waste. So in this case, you look at all the plastics that's there in our electronic devices, right? Our printers, our modems and so on. Okay, again, you might say, well, I don't need that old modem anymore, for instance. It's being replaced, but what about all that plastic casing? That can still function, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're converting that in our micro factories into these plastic filaments. These plastic filaments then can be used for 3D printing. And this is exactly what you're seeing here. These filaments then have to be, of course, of high quality. And when these filaments are of high quality, you can actually imagine that your local 3D printer, and I'm sure there are lots of beautiful maker spaces, because I did see one of them as I was driving in, who might just go, oh, actually, I'd rather use a recycled filament. And I'd rather use a filament that's been made by a local micro factory, if not in my town, but in the town next door. So what I'm actually doing is supporting local economy in this way. Right? So what we have to start to think about is if these kinds of local micro factories or regional settings could be doing this, you could very well be having a ripple effect in the economy. You could start to produce a whole range of different kinds of products in this way. And indeed, what we have done to be able to show that we can do it ourselves is set up our own micro factories at UNSW. This is an example of one of the micro factories that has got not only, of course, all the e-waste on one side that you see, but it's also got a micro furnace at the back of the room, so we can make alloys, we can make different kinds of materials and products that we've been talking about. But what about all of those things that don't necessarily require metals? They are the regular old ceramics that we use, you know, and so one might think, well, isn't that just your good old stone? What if you could make your ceramic products as green ceramics? And in this case, this is what you're seeing, our green ceramics in this apartment as kitchen splashbacks, floor tiles, island bench face, all made from green ceramics. And that contains waste glass and waste textiles. So we've taken again that local supply chain of what's available. We know there's plenty of waste glass in our economy. We certainly know there's plenty of waste textiles we can bring that together and show that the new science of micro recycling that we are talking about here is not just applicable to what happens to tires or what happens to e-waste right down at the micro level. In this case, the way we are transforming these two components, and you might go, how is it that a soft fabric can become a hard ceramic, right? Well, there's, there's where the secret lies, right? The secret source of what happens to that textile when we undergo that thermal transformation, a lot of these materials can control the way they behave, but we have to define that pathway so that a, a, a hard product at the end can be made. In this case, we're talking about these hard ceramic surfaces. Of course, we know that it's not just about the color of that old textile or that old fabric. There is a whole lot more to it in these materials and those fibers and the way they undergo transformation. And this is where, of course, the beauty of science lies, that it's about the science, it's about the technology, but also importantly, it's about how do we take it all the way to a micro factory. Talk about scalability. One of the things I always say to them, scalability has to always be fit for purpose. You've got to be able to bring your materials in from your local regions. You've got to have local markets in the region. And the fact that you may well have to deploy multiple micro factories because it helps you save 
transport costs is obviously a sensible way to approach it. It's no point having one mega factory in the middle of the country somewhere when you could actually deploy a few micro factories that allow you to take locally available waste materials and produce these kinds of green ceramics. And if we can do that locally, we're creating, of course, local jobs. We're encouraging that kind of local transformation of waste, businesses that might have you know, waste textiles or waste glass. But certainly we have to always bear in mind that we've got to reduce our consumption in the first place. This is not an answer to the fact that we keep consuming. As we know, the planet will not be able to cope if we continue to live the way we have been. So we all have to also think about our individual carbon footprint. If we can reduce our consumption, and on the other hand, look at how we might be able to purchase products and use those products that are made from recycled content. Because the minute you start to recycle materials and bring them back to life over and over again, you can actually reduce your carbon footprint. So the furnaces that Mollycop is operating in Newcastle actually takes scrap steel. And scrap steel, if you recycle that, which is they've been doing that for a long time, we're helping them to decarbonize further by replacing some of the coal with polymer injection technology of waste rubber tires coming in to liberate hydrogen molecules. But with any metal, the reason why metal is so good at allowing us to find different ways to make different kinds of metal alloys is for a long, long time, many researchers in the world have found different ways to control quality of metal and the different kinds of metal specifications. So in the same way, if we've been making different grades of steel, for instance, why can't we think about different grades of polymers and ceramics and if we can incorporate these supply chains? So in this case, if green ceramics were to be put in for different applications, hard floor surfaces, you know, or indeed if we start to bring different kinds of waste materials, our green hybrids are going to be all about producing maybe properties that you need, like acoustic properties. So there are many different ways in which you can start to think about functionality of different kinds of waste resources. Now again, it sounds really counterintuitive, right? Because you think, well, wait a minute, it was waste. We're sitting in a waste pile. What we are now doing is creating these hybrid materials and products where we're recognizing that it's not just about the material, it's about how you make it and its finished product properties. And this is what We've been showing that the science of micro recycling, of course, is complex because when we talk about these supply chains, these kinds of supply chains, of course, means that everything in our economy could well be benefiting if we all were to collaborate. And supply chains, as we define it, can be laterally integrated. So I know we're used to thinking about vertically integrated supply chains. The concept we're proposing here is really about a lateral integration. What does somebody who's got plastic waste or tire waste have in common with a manufacturer who might be looking to produce you know, different kinds of steels or different kinds of metal alloys? What does someone who's got a mattress recycling business, you know, unpacking those mattresses and saying, okay, I'll recycle my steel in there, but what about all of that textile waste that's there in our waste mattresses? What does a waste mattress recycler have in common with a green ceramics manufacturer, for instance? And that's exactly what we've shown, those laterally integrated supply chains, and indeed one of our first micro factories that we launched in Kudamandra last year was exactly about that. Because our industry partner was in the business of collecting waste mattresses. Now, of course, you know, either he could have just left the pile of all that waste textile lying around, or he could have done what he did, ended up doing in collaboration with us, which is, how about I take that? We help him set up a green ceramics micro factory. That waste textile becomes part of that production where glass and textile come together. So these are the kinds of, the blue circles really indicate to us that we are the market. We are the consumers of products. So if our waste mattresses can become part of a next generation of green ceramics, if our waste tires can become part of the next generation of how green steel is made, well then we're all living 
circular economy, right? We're all playing a part and in this way we support our local economies to prosper and thrive. We create those local supply chains of different kinds of products and this is what circular economy should look like. It's about these circular solutions where we all can play a role through collaboration and innovation. And, and indeed, whether we are people who own waste, you know, so of course councils who collect all of our waste from our homes are owners of this waste, connecting with producers and designers, and then having new products being made which come right back into use. So we've got some councils in Sydney, for example, Hornsby, that have taken on these green ceramics as part of what they're using. And for us, that was a great way to tell the story, that it came out of a local micro factory, local science, and of course being used um, right there in, in New South Wales. So part of what we have been doing, and I think, uh, I think my colleague Stuart will remember this uh, event that we went to, um, and UNSW plays an important role in kind of creating those supply chains. It's one thing to be able to say, well, we need to have this, but to play an active role in to be able to bring all of this to life is an important part of what we all should be doing. So the guy on the left there, Andrew, is the guy who's operating our micro factories. He's our licensee with uh, Can Do It Technologies, people in the middle. Ben and Maureen are people who have textile recycling companies. They provide those waste textiles. And you see um, my colleague Anibar in the photo there holding that little coffee table made from green ceramics. So that these are just examples of things that we have been doing. And for us, part of all of this is showcasing that we're actually in Australia pretty good at doing our science and technology. And we've got some incredibly amazing forward thinking industry partners. I've given you many examples, whether it's Mollycop, Kandui, and indeed in e-waste uh, companies like Tez, who are actually always constantly looking at how that science can be deployed. So it is important that we are looking at transforming those ideas into impact. And that's really why we need that science, because ultimately it helps us improve the quality of life for all of us on this planet. I'll tell you a little bit more about our micro factories um, in, in terms of how we've been actually doing this work. Um, and I've given you a few examples, uh, but to show you a few pictures, um, of course, as I said, waste glass is one of the key inputs um, and there's no shortage of waste glass, of course, as I'm sure we'd all agree if, if, if we could go around just, you know, looking at everywhere, including in our cars, where glass is available. And then, of course, we've got waste textiles as part of the input feedstock and the numbers are quite staggering globally. There's a lot of waste textiles, as you can imagine, that gets uh, buried. Um, or, or burnt, indeed, that's not what we want to see happening. Um, we want to be able to, you know, use our products, make quality products, and when it is no longer wearable, as something that we humans can wear, what about our homes can wear them, our kitchens can wear them, our furniture can wear them, this is what you're seeing, examples of these beautiful feature walls, floorings, furniture, and so on. But I guess to us, that's where that creativity comes in. So when you're celebrating the STEAM week and bringing together creative minds and scientists and engineers, there are no limits to what we can produce. And I think to me, this is what we love about working with, with designers, because once we start to show these different kinds of green ceramic products, they all want to start using them very quickly. So, so including um, indeed that, that feature wall there that you see on the, on the right with those LED lights behind them, we actually made those by incorporating those Hessian bags into, into that as an input textile. So there are no limits at all in terms of what you can do. Of course, the science has to be proven and shown that it works. Our micro factory on the top uh, is the one at UNSW and the one here um, at the bottom is the one that I said we've set up in Kudamandra and we're right in the middle of setting up a um, couple of micro factories uh, down along the south coast. So what does it actually look like? We've actually got these kinds of uh, panels. You can see our green ceramic panels. And if uh, someone wants to actually touch and feel them, I think I've got a few samples in my bag as well. <laughs> no wonder my bag was quite heavy. <laughs> um, so I guess it just goes to show that, that you know, we, we can start to not only make these, 
but we can encourage that local manufacturing to take place. We can encourage those local designers to get excited about what it means to have more sustainable products. This is what we did in Kodamandra. You can see when we first launched it about a year and a half ago um, in January of last year when, when literally all the modules um, came together. And I think we, we pretty much had all the modules working. But I guess when you start to think about all of these working in harmony together, these different modules to create the same product, I guess it's always a, a tricky thing to be kind of wondering whether the first time when everything comes to life together, whether it's all going to work. And of course, no pressure because we actually had ABC waiting there going, right, okay, um, yes, let's get started. <laughs> um, Fortunately, everything, of course, um, started to function. And for us, a lot of the learning that we had done in our own pilot facility um, at UNSW is what laid the foundation to be able to give us that, that confidence. So ultimately, what are we doing in terms of circular economy, bringing it to life? We're aligning recycling and manufacturing together. So imagine if you're recycling. It's not something you do separately out there but your recycling is actually built into manufacturing. It's part of your manufacturing process and the two things are just coming together. So if I'm a manufacturer, if I can take a lot of these materials like our steel making partner, like our green ceramics partner, well, they're actually manufacturers, but the fact that they're incorporating these waste resources as part of their supply chain, well, you can kind of say that they're recyclers too, aren't they? Because they're actually making recycling part of their operations. And this is exactly what we need for all of this to become mainstream. We need to start to think about how everyone starts to see these as various types of resources, valuable resources. So we've shown many, many pathways. And of course, to succeed, we have to be very clear. How do we define success? Which means we've all got to have shared values. If we care for our environment, if we care for all the benefits in a social setting that we have to deliver, where we look after our people and our planet, all of this is part of our success story. So the fact that we created those extra jobs that our industry partner, of course, did because they had to employ people in their micro factories is an example of success. The fact that we use all these waste resources to produce products that would have waste that would have otherwise gone to landfill is an example of success. So part of what we're doing now, of course, as I said, on one hand, all those waste plastics, um, using that as part of production is, is what we're exploring. But the question, of course, always is that are these products useful? Are there people who want to actually see this as, as a good way to replace some of the traditional products that they might have bought. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Those people who want to use in this particular case example of some clamps that people want to 3D printed. And this is exactly what our micro factories did. But also more broadly, you can imagine if we were producing those filaments in different regions, and if we had our micro factories with 3D printers, you could be printing this anywhere. Coming in this morning, having conversation with a potential collaborator who wants to produce some incredibly important products to improve how we deliver care for our eyes in remote communities requires these kinds of solutions. So she was excited when I told her, well, actually, we could 3D print some of the parts and components that she needs to develop these innovative solutions for her eyewear. And suddenly it meant that the world of community service and health comes together with manufacturing. Now these are, these are things that, you know, we need to make it happen, which goes back to our shared values. She comes from the world of medicine and health. I come from the world of manufacturing and recycling. And this is exactly what collaboration is all about. But most importantly, the fact that we can then deliver these kinds of services to our communities where it is absolutely essential that we continue to look after the health and well-being of our people. And in this instance, she was talking about how do you, how do you provide the right kind of care for our eyes and her, her solution, but to bring her solution to life in these remote communities. And for me, it's exciting because we want to be able to show that this form of manufacturing is more than just about thinking about making big things. So yes, people might say, well, everything has to be big and on large scale. But what we're defining is economies of purpose. 
economies of purpose is again back to that point. When we deliver these solutions, the purpose there that we've achieved are social benefits. And of course, in the long term, the economic benefits that will flow from that. So the kinds of supply chains that we've seen in the past, those typical conventional supply chains, where we take something, we use it, we dispose of. Now what if we had these kinds of circular supply chains? These kinds of circular supply chains are really complex because it goes right back to what we've been talking about. This kind of collaboration and the ability to think about how we might repair something, how we might reuse something, share it in, in our communities, and of course even to repair a part if you had a 3D printer, you could print some new parts as well. So in all of these cases, the ability to start to think about how we redesign our products and support those local economies, local ways of manufacturing, but to do it with some really clever solutions of materials and technologies is important. So for us, ultimately, it's very much about Collaboration, as you can tell, we've talked about collaboration with scientists, with researchers, with designers. And I think to me, that's the important piece. This is what we all have to do. And of course, all of us in communities, we choose how do we, how do we want to purchase our products? What kind of products we want? You know, should we be looking at that production that's happening in our local communities or in the town next door? Or should we just continue business as usual where products come in from somewhere and we know it's got a big carbon footprint, but you know what? We continue to ignore it. We know that that way of working and living does not make sense for our planet. We know that the more we can think local and regional solutions, we're going to enable many, many communities, not just in Australia, but globally start to see that there is hope for our planet. And I think this is what we're getting together to do is we're getting together to celebrate the STEAM week to show that there is hope and optimism and collaboration is what we need to look after our planet and our people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for some questions. When's your next appointment? Yeah, so if I can get away in the next five, ten minutes. Yeah. Just one, one or two one questions? Three. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, yeah no yeah. problem. Thank you very much, Vina. It's great. Thank you. I'm wondering if you've got a comment about the coal ash. We have the biggest coal ash dam, probably. Australia, power station, um, and there's a lot of talk about recycling the valuable chemicals in the coal ash. Have you got a comment about that, please? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, the way um, I've been presenting a holistic view about all kinds of materials, right? We have to be very, very careful that we just don't take a short term view, as in saying, well, as long as we can sort of just find a way to get rid of it, we'll be okay. Or as long as we do little some tweaks here, we'll be okay. I think we've got to think about a lot of these in a long-term sense. What are we gonna do about any waste resource that is complex? Is its transformation into another product, if that's what we're thinking about doing, or producing a chemical, or doing something else valuable with it? But I guess importantly, to be able to make sure in the way we do that manufacture and that remanufacture is safe and sustainable, and then I would ask the same question of the product that is then produced, is, is that product also safe and sustainable, right? So in all of these cases, it's about asking that holistic question. Whatever you produce, I mean, ultimately, we don't want to end up in a situation where we just simply sort of transfer one problem <laughs> into another problem, right? If we're going to spend time and effort and money in thinking about how we deal with some of these legacy issues, then we have to, of course, ask the question, have we collectively, as a community and local businesses, thought about what are some of those materials that are present in that ash? And of course, how are you going to produce those, if, if indeed chemicals is what people want to produce, how are you going to do it? And are you going to see that as something that then is a useful feedstock or a useful raw material or is it going to be a finished item and if so if it is a finished item then you know how 
how is it going to be used? So I guess having right from the beginning that holistic conversation and not a short term view would be my way of kind of approaching it right from the beginning as and of course collaboration very important communities have to play an important role local businesses have to support if that allows us to set up sensible industrial infrastructure that then can be utilized and benefit the community to create new jobs so it may well be that we also think about what kind of infrastructure is needed to manufacture those materials and if you were manufacturing important materials then thinking in the long term is that going to then create local jobs in the region and that investment in infrastructure is not just again a short term view but rather let's start to think about investment in you know really clever infrastructure for the longer term benefit of of our communities and our regions thank you professor sanchua for such a inspiring uh, talk I'm Karen Huntington, the Environmental Systems Manager at Lake Macquarie Council. Um, I'm really fascinated about your micro factories. Mm -hmm. um, are they easy to operate and, and also are there different types of micro factories or can you use the one micro factory to be um, manufacturing all these different types of products? Yeah, what a what a what a brilliant question! I'm so glad, <laughs> and, and and thank you so much for asking that question because I think that's that really you've you've gone really to the heart of that question about micro factories. What you probably saw in those pictures is that they are modular in nature, so they're different modules. And of course, the reason why we've made it modular is that you can actually think about these doing different functions, right? So if you're doing, let's say you've got two different modules both of them don't have to make the same product. So the kinds of examples that I showed you, you might have one that's processing plastic, so you might make those plastic filaments. You might then say, well, okay, well, I also want to be able to produce some building panels and products like you know we've talked about. So that might be a different supply chain. So it really does come down to the ability to be able to think in that modular fashion, but also then not just for different products, but think in a way that if I want to grow my capacity in the long term, I can do that down the road. I don't have to think up front. You know, when you think about a large factory, you think I've got to have a huge amount of money and I've got to have all of the things running all at the start. In this case, in fact, that's exactly what we're doing with our industry partner at the moment is building more capacity by adding more modules. Um, and that's the beauty of it because if you're a small operator or if you're a small region or you want to start with the limited capacity, you can actually say, okay, well, I'll set up these few modules and then I'll move on from there. In terms of operations, you asked a question. I mean, this is why we were very particular that we partnered up. So Can Dewey Technologies is our technology partner and they are our, our um, licensee for, for our green ceramics micro factories because we wanted to be able to show that, you know, that science and engineering and technology is all doable right here in Australia. Right? So you've got a local tech company that now is walk the walk them, uh, the, the talk themselves, right? I mean, it's not that they're just coming in for a day, theoretically telling you what to do. These are the people who are doing it day in and day out. So also it builds confidence in terms of any other operators who might go, okay, well, actually, you know, I think I even showed you Andrew's photo there. <laughs> um, this guy's been doing it for a while now. I, I think he knows what he's doing, right? But that's important. That's an important question because quite often, you know, if you are not in that mode of manufacturing and operating, you need to be able to rely on that tech support. Um, so in that sense, that's what, what um, you know, he does. And, and of course, he is our partner. So a lot of times for us, when challenges come in that have never before been seen, we continue to do that science and prototyping uh, in our own labs. Um, so that from his point of view, he's not kind of taking that responsibility. He's really taking the responsibility for delivery of um, technologies. So in that sense, I guess my point always is and to your point about how easy it is I think you were saying to operate I think it's part of that same thinking right of course it's it's manufacturing you know I'm not saying oh well it's easy um, you know it is it is about like any other new system that you set up like any other new manufacturing facility you set up it requires you know people to get trained up um, requires people to understand all the safety and operations issues it requires all of that training but again this is why when we talk about you know what kind of training and skills and experience i mean not everyone walks into any new job 
on day one and knows exactly what they have to do, right? So it's like everything else, you know, skilling up, you know, getting that opportunity to have training, um, you know, with us might just be exactly how we transition people into that way of doing things. Uh, but I guess that's the important thing. I mean, at UNSW, our own pilot micro factories, if I can use our own example, um, when we trained up some of our students, um, and, and of course they, they kind of you know, got that hands-on experience, they are exactly the kind of people that Andrew's now employed to work in his micro factory. So I guess that probably answers the question in a way that you know, we do need to support young people as they learn and come through their studies um, and get that practical hands-on experience, but we also need to kind of give that hope to say, well, actually, these are the kinds of jobs you could, you could be uh, you know, engaged in. So I think, I think there is a lot of um, cause for optimism and hope when we all collaborate. Yeah, today, I know you're running a piece of the day, um, so please um, thank you, Professor Alina. Thank you for having me. <laughs>